A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean. For several months, he's been traveling across this lifeless land, and he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also, there are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains, boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderer is walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now, all that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes it complicates his life. Like now, for example, in the distance he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet, a bottle of water. The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap. Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters, they're gonna take everything. The wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The marauders are closing in on him. The wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the mate and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong 
that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed. Driven by the wind, they travel the world and poison everything around. The wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide. Thanks to this, comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet, but not anymore. Several days have passed. The wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. The Wanderer has a new goal. He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. Breaking news! Mercury is getting smaller. Well, we used to think that our planet was the only one in the solar system that had tectonic activities, meaning that the planet releases heat because plates under the crust move, which changes the surface and eventually makes the planet smaller. But it happens on Mercury, too. Researchers took pictures of the planet back in 2016. These pictures showed landforms that were reminiscent of cliffs. They're called fault scarps. Since they are relatively small, the team believes they were formed not very long ago, which means Mercury is still contracting, even 4.5 billion years after the solar system formed. Mercury has a solid inner core, and there's a liquid metal outer core that surrounds it. 
it's still going through a cooling process. In fact, all rocky planets are still cooling from the times when they were initially formed. As those liquid parts of the planet's core become more solid, the planet contracts and becomes smaller. How come you don't see planets twinkling like stars? If you were up in space, you wouldn't see stars twinkling. But on Earth, you see it because of the atmosphere. Our protective blanket of air refracts the light of stars, which means it scatters it in a zigzag pattern. We perceive this as the twinkle. Planets appear way bigger than just pinpoints. Their light also zigs and zags after hitting the Earth's atmosphere, but these motions kind of cancel each other out, which is why we see their steady light. Now, if you brought a block of lead on Venus, it would melt like a block of ice on our home planet. The surface temperature on Venus goes up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Even when researchers send spacecraft up there, it can't withstand the environment for too long. One craft, for instance, landed there in 1982 and managed to stay for only two hours. But a team still got the first color pictures of Venus and analyzed some of the planet's soil. Planets collide with asteroids, comets, other planets, and the rest of the celestial bodies that move through space. But galaxies also collide. Milky Way, our galaxy, is about 2.5 million light-years away from Andromeda, our closest galaxy neighbor. They are getting closer and speeding toward each other at 250,000 miles per hour. It's inevitable. One day they'll collide and everything will change. Two galaxies will merge into one brand new, unique one. And some planets and stars won't survive. But according to predictions, this won't happen for another 4 billion years. Plenty of time to, well, do most anything. The combination of the gravity on our planet and the gravitational force of the moon leads to changes in ocean tides. So when you jump, you're pulled back to the land because of the invisible force that pulls things toward each other called fill in the blank. Gravity, good for you. The moon has about 80 times smaller mass than the Earth, but it still has a gravitational pull. As our planet rotates, the moon's gravitational pull influences the closest part of the Earth. It affects the whole planet, not just the water. But the land is denser than the water, which is why we see the effects of the moon's gravity on the water only. And the results are the tides. On the opposite side of our planet, the one that's farthest from the moon and where the moon's gravity is the weakest, the tide is high because the moon pulls the rest of the Earth towards itself, away from us. What do you think space smells like? Well, you can't actually smell it because your nose doesn't work in a vacuum. But astronauts that work aboard the ISS have said they've noticed a specific metallic aroma on the surface of their spacesuits after repressurizing the airlock. They compared it to the odor of welding fumes. Other things in space have a specific smell, too. For instance, there's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere of Uranus, which smells like rotten eggs. Venus and Mars have a similar odor. The atmosphere on Mercury is quite sparse, which means it doesn't have much of a smell. On Jupiter, it depends where you are in the atmosphere. Some parts have high levels of ammonia, so you'd smell something like cleaning fluid. Other parts have an egg-like smell, but the rest, the parts with high levels of hydrogen cyanide, smells like bitter almonds. And you don't want to take a big whiff of that, trust me. Here on our planet, when you try to fuse two metal bits together, you have to apply enough heat that the metal gets to its melting point. It's way simpler up in space. You don't need heat or any action at all to stick two pieces of metal together forever. It's something we know as cold welding. It happens when the metal bits slide over each other. They have protective oxide layers. On the Earth, that's something that stops them from fusing. But in space, this type of protection is gone. So the electrons from one metal piece simply flow into the other one, and they become one. There are rocks from space all over the Earth. In 1996, a geologist found a rock in the Sahara Desert. After studying its composition, scientists realized they hadn't seen anything like it before, even on other planets or with other meteorites. One theory says this stone was even older than our solar system. It had a specific combination of elements that was probably characteristic of early solar nebula. Pluto was demoted from a planet to a dwarf planet, partially because of another dwarf planet called Eris. Eris was found in 2005. 
it has a similar size as Pluto, so astronomers were worried that the number of space bodies that orbit the Sun and that are waiting to be discovered might have been compromised when it comes to being an official planet. So after they discovered Eris, they set up new standards for a celestial body to be called a planet. Round, orbit the Sun, and orbit clear of small objects are just some of the criteria for a celestial body to be considered as a planet. And you have to score well on the SAT. There are more than 20,000 pieces of space junk, junk that humans created, circling around our planet. And these are just the pieces that are larger than a softball, while the real number of total pieces our researchers track is way bigger, somewhere around 500,000. There are millions of bits so small we can't even track them. In space, junk can move at high speeds, sometimes more than 17,500 miles per hour. That means even small objects, like a chip of paint, can damage an operational spacecraft. So the International Space Station has to carefully maneuver itself to avoid space junk. And there's another potential problem there. It's called Kessler syndrome. When there's so much junk in low orbit of our planet, it smashes together, which leads to more and more debris, like some sort of space domino effect. One of the potential ways to solve this is by using nets that would push the objects into our atmosphere, and then we could clean up at least some of the space junk. Neptune has a pretty interesting moon called Triton. It kind of reminds us of Pluto because of its similar composition, but it's also in retrograde orbit. Triton is probably one of the icy objects in the Kuiper Belt. Neptune's gravity probably trapped it at some point and turned it into its own moon because Triton has been orbiting Neptune ever since, and it's been doing it in the opposite direction that Neptune is rotating. One of Triton's coolest features is its erupting geysers. There's water on two of Saturn's moons. The first one, Enceladus, has a whole ocean made up of salt water. And based on some complex organic molecules, there could even be a sign there's some form of life. But this is just a theory that no one can yet confirm. Titan, the other moon, could also have signs of life. Any place in space that has both carbon-containing chemicals and water is a potential home for some form of living organism. What's the coldest planet in our solar system? Your first thought is probably Neptune, since it's the farthest planet from the Sun. But it's actually Uranus. It's 20 times further away from the Sun than we are. The average temperature at its cloud tops, and that's what we call the surface temperature in gas giants since they don't have a solid surface, is minus 315 degrees Fahrenheit. Enough to give you a bad case of freezer burn. Planets that are so far away from our sun can't get much heat, which is why some heat comes from their core, similar to how the core of our planet is hotter than the surface. But it's not enough, so both Neptune and Uranus are cold. But Neptune has methane in its atmosphere. On Earth, methane is a greenhouse gas, which means it traps heat like a thick jacket that keeps you warm. And Uranus has less methane in its atmosphere, which is why it's a bit colder than Neptune, even though Neptune is farther. Speaking of Uranus, did you know a season there lasts for one pretty long day? Yup, that one day is equal to 42 years. The planet makes a single circle on its axis in 17 hours. But its tilt is so pronounced that one or the other pole is mostly directed towards the Sun. This means that a day on the planet's North Pole lasts 42 Earth years, which is half of a Uranian year. So if you could go to Uranus and stand on its North Pole, you'd see the sunrise in the sky. You'd circle around for the entire summer, after which you'd face 42 years of darkness and winter. Uh, no thanks, I'll stay here. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, 
there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those hums at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. 
Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink sea water. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trapped between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks can live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly. But some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet.